As we enter this season of Advent, may the love of God the Father and the grace of Jesus the Son and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with us all. Amen. Well, good morning. Welcome to Chapel by the Sea on this, the first Sunday of Advent. It's the very first Sunday of the Christian year. So, Happy New Year and welcome to church. If you're visiting with us today, I invite you to find the pew card in the pew rack in front of you. Simply <laughs> fill it out, drop it in the offering plates as it comes by, so we'll know how to reach out to you and welcome you to this great community of faith. Also following the service, we have the best orange juice in all of Florida, and we invite you to stick around and join us in our friendship foyer. Have a nice glass of OJ and a good conversation, and uh, you never know what happens after that. Called Mimosa. No, not today. <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> it's your turn. My turn? Mm -hmm, yep. All right. All right. Big week next week. Who knows what next Sunday is? It's the 10th. <laughs> no, it's, uh, it's the family Christmas service where we have the kids do the whole service. Rhonda gets most of the day off, right? Yes. Um, we hope you'll join us for that. It's a lot of fun. Following that service, we will have a, a little luncheon, and Santa will come by and visit them. Then immediately following that, for those who are in the Sunday Man's Search for God program, Tom, you're, you're gonna be, it's a lot of breakfast burritos today for you, buddy. <laughs> okay, okay, Raylene's here. Uh, following, on that Sunday, we'll still have our program. It'll just follow the Santa visit and the food, and we feed you anyway, so come on in, all right? So please, be here for that. I think you'll enjoy that. All right, today we're after church. We're also having the shell sale. Say that 10 times really fast. <laughs> shell sale. <So. laughs> the friends of the Clearwater Beach Library and Recreation um, have put together some beautiful creations, which they are selling, not shelling, they are selling to support the Library and Recreation Center. So I hope you'll stick around and look at what they have created. Um, also, our tree in the narthex is our memory tree. See, I've learned all this. You, you, I've had this education over the past week or so. The memory tree, and you can write the name of a loved one and hang it on the tree in memory of someone you have loved um, on that tree today. So I hope you'll do all that after church. Okay, how many here have had a chance to walk down this corridor to go into the chapel hall? Anybody notice that, that new wall, that pretty wall that's gone up? Uh, those are where the bathrooms are or used to be. <laughs> Now they're just storage spaces. Um, and by the way, my compliments to Rhonda and the uh, committee for taking the time to find those decorative porta potties that are sitting outside, because that's what we have now in place of those. Although we do have two other bathrooms by the, what is that, the north door? Yeah, the north door that enters mm -hmm. the chapel hall. So if you're walking by there and it's a quick walk, then go to the back bathrooms. They're there for your use. And also following the service, Joe will be in one of those porta potties and then we can tip it over. <laughs> I think I'm going to sit down now. <laughs> we are entering this beautiful season of Advent. We have lots going on. There are two new events this year that I want to draw your attention to. The first, on December the 13th, um, our amazing chapel choir will be sharing some of their very special. Uh, pieces for us to enjoy, so I hope you'll come out for that, which will be followed by a wine and cheese reception. So this is something you're going to want to invite your neighbors to and all your many friends. Bring them out, because this is going to be a glorious night in the life of our church. Another event that's new this year is a service of remembrance and hope. Some of you may know how hard it is to face the holidays without someone you love, so this will be a chance to come and name that to light a candle in honor or in memory of someone you have loved and lost. It will be a, a short, a solemn, but a beautiful service. I hope you'll consider coming to one or both of those new events. Um, in the Friendship Foyer, there's a flyer detailing all of this. Pick one up if you don't already have one. Hang it on your fridge, put it in the clubhouse or the gym so others can know and be a part. So on this, the first Sunday of Advent, we welcome this newborn child. We anticipate his coming, and we say, come, Lord Jesus, come, come be with us. Um, so let us consider what that means in each of our lives as we worship the Lord today in spirit and in truth.
Responsively with our call to worship, a shoot shall come out of the stump of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Righteousness shall be the belt around his waist, and faithfulness the belt around his loins. Let us join in unison with our invocation. Today, O oh God, we are united in our presence, in the fellowship of your Son, Jesus. And though we come from many different places and come with many different needs, we know that you will pour out your blessing so that as we leave, we may leave with the consciousness that we have met you today. For this we praise you. We're now going to have the lighting of the first Advent candle. Dwight, is he here? Here he comes. Let us join responsibly, responsibly in the discussing the candle of hope. 
Hope is a light given by God at the beginning of creation. Hope is the gift of God. Hope is the gift of God revealed in the life of Christ. Hope is a light given by God, the Son of God, the Son of Mary. Let us sing together as we light the Advent candle of hope.
In gratitude for the many gifts we've received and in commitment to our church, let us be generous in our morning offering. prayer, even as we seed, so we give. Bless, O Lord, these gifts, those who give them, and that for which it's intended. Amen.
Let us pray. God of our beginning and our end, we confess to you that we live in a world that desperately needs your mercy. And as we celebrate the coming of your Son, we recognize that hope does not come so easily to everyone. Many cry out for healing in a broken world. Gracious God, grant your mercy. We pray this day especially for children in places of violence who struggle to find happiness and fulfillment, who hunger for love, for compassion. Gracious God, grant your mercy. We pray for the victims of domestic violence, those who will spend the holidays at the Haven, who long for peace, for healing, Gracious God, grant your mercy. We pray for people who suffer from alcoholism, for substance abuse, who seek an escape from that which they cannot solve by themselves, who despair at seeing no way out. Gracious God, grant your mercy. We pray for worshiping communities of faith that seek to heal the world, who preach love in the face of hate and welcome the stranger as a friend, who work to better themselves and share their blessings with others. Gracious God, grant your mercy. We pray for those dear to us who struggle with cancer, other illnesses, who desire comfort in the face of pain, who wait for healing and peace. Gracious God, grant your mercy. We pray for those who grieve, who have lost children or parents or other loved ones, who find the holidays a difficult time. Gracious God, grant your mercy. And now we pray for those we lift to you in our silence. And praying the prayer our Lord Jesus Christ taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. It came upon a midnight wind That glorious song of old
Our reading today comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 1, beginning with verse 18. You can find this in your pew Bible on page 783. Hear now the word of the Lord. Now the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, took place in this way. When his mother, Mary, had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband, Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And all this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had borne a son, and he named him Jesus. Thanks be to God for the reading of God's word.
Thank you, choir. If you don't mind, this morning I was a little rushed. I didn't get a chance to read the paper. <clears throat> so I'll just kind of browse the headlines, then we'll start the sermon. All right. Hmm. Global warming, pipeline spills. Hey, they caught the one who kills. Opioids, crystal meth. Hmm. Should we sentence folks to death? Emails, Russia, politics. Rigged, you know the system's fixed. Growing wealth disparity, income inequality, races clash, immigration, border wall between nations, Nazis march and tempers flare, vote suppression can't be fair, perverts on the left and right, <clears throat> North Korea's bombs take flight. And into this mess, God sends a baby. Are you kidding me, God? We need a savior, not a baby. A baby, a baby needs our care. A baby we must coddle and feed and change. We don't need a savior we have to babysit. Send, send a mighty warrior who can just ax off the bad guys. Or, or Lord, maybe you could send a great orator who can, who can rise up the better angels from within. Or maybe, maybe a great saint who could give us all what we need, kind of like a Saint Nick for grown-ups. Or a wizard who, with the wave of a wand, could wipe out all of our ills. But a baby? We don't need a savior. We have to babysit. Or do we? The story from the Gospel of Matthew is the shorter version of, the, of this birth narrative. We're more familiar with the Lucan account, you know, the, the one that we'll read on Christmas Eve. That one has all the poetry and, and all the many stories. This Matthew account is so short. But one difference is in, in Luke, Joseph is just kind of a bit player. He gets a starring role according to Matthew. Do you know that Matthew, in, in the Gospel of Matthew, Joseph has encounters with angels four times? Four times in two chapters, Joseph experienced an angel. And so this first time, this is the first angel encounter that Joseph had. And the angel comes and says, fear not, Joseph. And the angel comforts Joseph and helps Joseph realize that this conception was not quite normal, that this would be a great man who would save his people from their sins. And then Matthew does something interesting. He interpreted this account for us. He stops mid-story and he says, Now, you Hebrew readers, you got to remember that this was a fulfillment of prophecy from the book of Isaiah. So the book of Isaiah said, And behold, the virgin shall conceive and shall bring forth a child and shall call him Emmanuel. And so Matthew quotes that for us to help us make sense of this all. And in this one verse is both difficulty and hope. All in this one verse, Matthew chapter 1, verse 23. What do you mean, preacher, difficult and hopeful? Well, you have time? <clears throat> Let's start with the difficult part first. That whole virgin birth thing. Now, if I were to take a poll, and I'm not going to do that, 
If I were to take a poll, I bet we would be divided a little bit. Some people would say, yes, I believe in a literal virgin birth. Others would say, I believe in more of a figurative virgin birth. I would say we have people in both camps. You see, since the beginning of modernity and with the advent of the scientific method, we, we like to see evidence-based facts. We like our evidence through the scientific method. We like to be able to prove these things. And so people who are scientifically minded sometimes have a hard time with the miracles in the Bible. I've been privy to more than one debate, we'll call it, between Christians, devout Christians on both sides who like to debate whether this virgin birth was a literal virgin birth. One of my favorite stories about that comes from Phyllis Tickle. Phyllis was a great thinker and writer, died just a couple of years ago, to my great dismay. And Phyllis tells a story. She was at a church one day, leading kind of a conference. There was a dinner. The youth had served the dinner. And she began to facilitate a conversation with the folks there, the grown-ups at the church, about whether the virgin birth was literal or not. And so the conversation got kind of lively around that. And she noticed that as the kids were cleaning up the, the dinner and the adults were lively, lively, is that a word, conversing, there was this one kid, and it couldn't have been more than, she said about 16, 17. And he kind of paused his cleanup duties and became really engaged in the adults' conversation. And afterwards, he kind of hung around. All the adults had taken off, and he came up to Phyllis, and he said, can I ask you a question? She said, of course. He said, I just don't get it. She said, what, what do you mean? You know, the conversation about the, the virgin birth, I, I just don't get it. She said, explain to me. He said, this story of the virgin birth well, it's just so beautiful that it has to be true, whether it happened or not. So I'll leave that right there with you. Let's talk about the more hopeful part of the verse to me. In one word, the writer engages my heart and my imagination. You know what that one word is? Emmanuel, which he defines for us. Emmanuel, God with us. And that is a concept that was mind-blowing at the time. This was a radical departure from the standard thinking about God and God's nature. So just for a moment, I want to take a little history trip back in time. 2,000 years prior to this story from the Gospel of Matthew, 2,000 years prior, a man walked the planet, and his name was Father Abraham. Had many sons. Father Abraham, the father of Christianity, Judaism, Islam. All three primary monotheistic religions trace our history back to Abraham. And within those three traditions, we all believe that Abraham was the founder of monotheism. All right, you're going to have to hang with me on this one, guys. The founder of monotheism, the one God concept. You see, prior to that, polytheism ruled today. There were all kinds of gods. You may remember your Greek or Roman mythology. A God for this and a God for that and a God for that. Abraham said, one God. The Lord is one, we read in the Shema from Deuteronomy. And this, this was a mind-blowing transformation in the way they thought about God at the time of Abraham. It was so hard for them to grasp over the course of the generations that even six generations passed Abraham. So Abraham's great, 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 great grandson was a guy you may have heard of. His name was Moses. And Moses went up on the mountain to receive the Ten Commandments, and guess what they were doing down below? Building a golden calf to Baal. 
six generations later, this, this radical idea, this change in thinking about God had not yet taken hold in the people. Now, fast forward 2,000 years later, and a man named Jesus is about to be born, and he would be called Emmanuel. And that was such a revolutionary idea at the time. So by now, we're used to monotheism, one God. But that God was way out there, heaven somewhere, or in the Holy of Holies at the temple. Only the high priest to go in one time a year. So this God with us thing, this was, this was new and, and difficult for us to grasp. Fast forward 2,000 years past that, to you and me, we're still not there. We're still not there because we still think of God as being out there somewhere beyond. But God is with us. Why does that matter? So what, preacher, blah, 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 let me tell you what. Just an example from my, from my past, way back when, 100 years ago when I was in seminary. This was a pastoral care class, part of the core curriculum. And I was right out of, right out of college, but others there were more seasoned, had been in ministry a while. The conversation turned to when, we, when a pastor goes to make a hospital visit. That's a common thing pastors do. And this, this classmate of mine said, you know, I, I have so much trouble doing hospital visits. He said, I go to the hospital, and, and these people are, are in sometimes deathly ill or in great pain or, or whatever it may be. He said, and I get the doctors, you know, the doctors can prescribe and diagnose and even do surgery. The nurses can provide care and check blood pressure and do practical things. And, and I know, I know, you're going to say, well, you offer prayer. I know, I get that. He said, but my prayers feel so impotent sometimes. Now, I'll never forget what the professor said. The professor said, you bring something the medical professionals can't. By your very presence there, he said, you remind them that God is with them. Never underestimate the power of knowing that God is there. These many years later, I remember that. Emmanuel, God with us. There's a power that produces a peace that passes all understanding. In that one simple truth, God with us. The question is, are we with God? As we shift our focus to the table of the Lord, this first Sunday of Advent, we remember that this is Jesus, the Son of God, the Son of Mary, our God with us. This is the Lord's table. He is the host. We are God's guests. God welcomes everyone to come and eat and be nourished. Our table is open to all. So come and eat and live. Let us pray together. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these your gifts of bread and wine, that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be the communion of the body and blood of Christ. By your Spirit, unite us with the living Christ and with all people everywhere that we may be one in every place. As this bread is Christ's body for us, 
Send us out to be the body of Christ in the world. Amen. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it. And he offered it to his disciples, saying, This is my body, broken for you.
In the same way, Jesus took the cup, and after giving thanks, he offered it to his disciples, saying, This is my blood poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Take this bread, take this cup in remembrance of me. Beloved sons and daughters of God, you are God's chosen, called, loved. Now remember that God is with you. May you be with God, heart, soul, spirit, and mind. Amen.